and welcome to the VPD Bunch Brunch, where we get together with our favorite brunchy beverages to talk about all things VPD. I'm your host, Zanny, and today I'm here with Sophie, and the two of us are going to chat with Dr. Monica Thomas, who is a licensed psychologist and director of addiction recovery services at Northwell Health in New York. Hi, folks. So Dr. Thomas specializes in treating individuals with substance misuse and frequently utilizes DBT in her clinical practice. She also teaches psychology doctoral classes in universities and takes an active role in training and education of substance misuse for faculty, staff, and trainees. So what is everybody's brunchy beverage for today? I just have coffee, so... <laughs> Water, good old water. Gotta stay hydrated. I have water in this fancy cup that I usually have coffee in, but I already had too much coffee. <laughs> oh, it looks so warm and cozy. <laughs> so, Dr. Thomas, tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your work. So, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. I came into substance use um, not knowing too much about it, and when I started learning a little bit more and seeing individuals um, who were misusing substances, I really learned to love to love it and so I wanted to stay and I also fell in love with DBT too and I frequently integrate the work in my clinical practice especially with uh, folks who have substance misuse. Right so question number one what makes DBT useful in treating substance issues? That's a really good question. What I love about DBT is their specific tangible skills especially in the beginning too when folks come in especially um, to see me or in the program, they're a bit more anxious that, you know, they're not quite stabilized, they're using, they're anxious, they're scared. Um, and so DBT really helps so they could relax a little bit. The other thing too is that it's, it's really good with folks who have issues with um, reacting too quickly, being impulsive. Um, also with poor interpersonal skills or communication skills. It's just wonderful and that's why I fell in love with DBT and that it literally gives you like these few skills to do it, which is amazing. So DBT, you know, overall is not hard at all. It's hard to do, definitely. It's hard to practice. Um, and so it works perfectly with substance use. I mean, DBT in the beginning was created especially for borderline personality disorder, but as the years went on, it, it's been used for a lot of different disorders. Um, and so substance use just fits really, really well with it. Yeah. Wow. Since not all of our viewers have, have done DBT or know what it is, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like one of the important uh, concepts of DBT that may be very useful is this idea of like, you're doing the best that you can and you can still change. Yes, we're doing the best that we can. And also, I think there's also a misconception or maybe there's a Smith in that, you know, we don't have any control of anything that we do. I think sometimes, you know, individuals think that maybe in the past they didn't have control uh, because of, you know, psychosocial stuff that was going on in their environment or just, you know, you know, genetic sometimes. But I mean, I love this metaphor in that just because you come from a family who may have heart disease or diabetes, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have it as well. Right, um, right. You know, we're vulnerable to it. Um, but, the, the, you know, if I eat a cake every day, if I eat sugar, I'm sure I'll get it. But if I manage <laughs> sort of my intake, then maybe I won't, you know, but I have to realize that it's sort of in me. Um, but I can't take control of it and sort of move forward. And that's the other really thing that I love about DBT and that it gives you hope, you know, that we're not here to blame, you know, your parents and not here to blame anyone else in the past. We're just trying to understand what happened so we could move forward and don't do that again. Um, and hopefully this time we have a little bit more power and more control of where we want to go. This is beautiful because um, I did mentalizing based therapy. So it's pretty different. Like you don't get, you don't receive skills. So um, it's really helpful to hear these things. Like you have strategies basically to um, help you to move forward. It is. I mean, there's even, you know, um, sort of like the dying game. If we're into personal skills and you're sort of supposed to add like 10 cents for 10 questions, the more that you get a dollar, the more sort of power to you to ask for what you want or like the more power for you to say no. Right. So it also helps, you know, for us to be assertive, to get what we want, but also to form our boundaries. And literally, I was just amazed in the beginning that you just have 10 questions, but they work so perfectly. And you're like, yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. 
So it's called the dime game. Yeah, it's called a dime game. Some of the examples of the questions, just for anyone who's like, what the heck is that? If things like, um, is like, if you're going to ask for something, one of the questions is, is this appropriate to the relationship, right? Is this something the person is able to give you? Are they obligated to give this to you? Do you give as much as you take in this relationship? These kinds of things that help you figure out um, how, like how much you should commit to trying to get what you want or how firmly you should resist if somebody is asking you for something. So it just helps you re work out the, the, the approach, sort of the appropriate intensity for, for the interaction. Because those of, especially those of us with BPD, we really struggle. It's like, it's either all, we're all in or all out. So is the like essence of it that for every dime you get, um, that makes it more feasible, like more of a, more that power you should to do you. it? Yeah, it's like a scoring. It's like a scoring. If you score, um, let's say 70 cents or 80 cents, it's like, go for it. You know, either, you know, ask That's for what so you want good. or say no. If it comes out to like, or three or four, it's like, mm, you know, maybe think about it, you know, like go back again. If it's definitely a lower score, it's like, you know, don't do it um so it does it's just That's amazing awesome. yeah so dbt in that sense has so many skills like that and it makes it a little bit easier but i think the hard part of it is actually a practice i mean we have control of ourselves but i don't have control over you right i don't have control over the person that i'm interacting with yeah. so how can i respond how can i like manage my emotions when i don't get what i want but i'm still doing the best that i can and you know doing you know my best skill work you know, doing basically everything that I need to do and everything that I want to do, but I still don't get what I want. What do I do? And so um, it also helps you to sort of manage that as well. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And for someone like me, that would work because it, it's very tangible. Mm -hmm. To change track a little bit, what has changed in your work and some of your observations since the arrival of the pandemic? And what are some of the things we can learn from it in regards to substance use? <laughs> That's a really another good question, too. I think the pandemic, you know, really hit us all really hard and we're sort of still in it. But I think at the peak of the pandemic, um, remember when we had like the lockdowns and all that stuff where we couldn't go out or only certain you know places were opened? There was a lot of controversy in regards to having uh, liquor stores opened and selling alcohol. If you stop drinking automatically, um, you can have horrible side effects. Um, you could have seizures, crazy withdrawals, you know, a lot of medical, you know, consequences, which would make the person go into the ER. And if you remember during COVID, the ER and basically a lot of folks were dying. And so they wanted to make sure that all the manpower that they had there was for folks um, with serious COVID, you know, reactions. So um, we didn't sort of want to... Um, have all those people, you know, go into the ER and not get the, the help that they needed. Um, so we wanted to make sure that obviously, you know, that nothing was going to happen to them. We wanted to reduce the risk of death. So that's why the liquor stores were pretty much open. I think during that time too, a lot of people, you know, were using. So the people that were already had serious, you know, issues with using drugs or alcohol, I think that was another sort of um, pro, let's say, to continue using, sort of continue the isolation. And and so what happens is what do we do now? And what we're seeing, I, and, and again, it's not just in New York, I think, you know, in the U.S., I'm not quite sure, in, you know, in Europe and stuff. But I think um, there's more serious use at the moment. Um, you know, we all know about the op opioid epidemic, you know, that's been going on for a while. Um, but it's even more serious now. Alcohol is more severe as well. And we're also seeing it in the younger population. So you would think, you know, folks who um, need a liver transplant or um, have, you know, other serious medical problems might be a little bit older, 50s, 60s, you know, right? Because if they've been drinking since like, let's say 12 or 13. But no, we're seeing very young kids. Um, we see um, 18 and over, so I can't quite say about adolescents. But, you know, we do see 18, 19, 20 year olds who need a liver transplant because of their serious alcohol use. And you and you think of the alcohol use and then you think of the lockdown. Um, so their social development sort of paused. And if there was anything going on at home either as well, 
that might have also contributed to sort of like their negative behaviors and sort of how they were feeling about themselves. And perhaps the only way that they could sort of manage was, you know, drinking or using. Um, so on a good on the good side is we are seeing people come in for treatment. So hopefully it keeps moving in a positive direction. You're talking about the, the increase during the pandemic. And I, I think I heard so many statistics, not about substance use in particular, but about you know, the rise of mental health issues. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me of the fact that these two things are not separate, right? If mental health mm. issues as a whole are rising, it's not too surprising that substance use issues are also going to Right. Yeah, you, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, I think some people think that substance use is different from mental health, but it's not. You can't put them on different corners of the room. They influence each other. And I think, you know, yes, yeah, so there's less destigmatization, I guess, in regards to mental health. It's getting more awareness. It's getting, you know, especially to the younger, you know, population. But I also think substance use still is very stigmatized. You know, I see a lot of folks that come in and they're like, no, I don't have a substance use problem. I have depression, I have anxiety, or, you know, I have this other, you know, bipolar. Um, and it's it's because they feel stigmatized. You know, they don't want me to, they're going to have further judgment or they feel like we're going to judge them even more or maybe be a little bit more punitive because they have substance use. But just because they feel so guilty and embarrassed and shameful of what's going on first with mental health, but then also you're adding substance use. So I think, you know, at the end, it's really, you know, I don't really care what diagnosis you have or what label it comes to. It's just managing, like, what are you coming in here for? How can we better your life? So what are some of the most common issues for people with co-occurring substance use and BPD and what is your approach to helping them? Yeah, so a lot of it too is, you know, emotional, you know, dysregulation, um, trying to manage the negative and the positive emotions. I think a lot of us think, oh, we just have to, you know, manage the negative emotions. But I think we have to manage the positive emotions as well, because those are emotions. <laughs> There's a lot of communication skills, uh, interpersonal skills. Trauma also is very um, on the top, just not necessarily, you know, sexual or child abuse, but it could be, you know, invalidation. Maybe in the past we didn't think of as, as trauma. We thought of trauma as, you know, 9-11 or, you know, something that veterans go through or sexual abuse. But, you know, invalidation is trauma and it does really affect how we grow up and sort of how we see ourselves, how we see other people and how we see the world. In my clinical practice and in, in our program here that we run, we're very um, compassionate. So DBT is very compassionate, even though DBT is very straightforward and it takes sort of like this irreverent sort of tone to it. Um, it's very transparent. So a lot of us, including myself, will say the reason why I'm asking you all these questions is because of A, B and C. You know, um, I sort of not let the the individual sort of guess like, oh, where is she going? Like, I you won't know where I'm going <laughs> with all these yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, and being a little bit more transparent and making sure that there's a relationship, you know, with the clinician. And so that's very important too. You know, I could give you all these skills that you need to do, but if you don't have trust in me, it goes nowhere at all. Um, and so I have to sort of earn your trust. Um, and vice versa, like it's it's a dual relationship. Once we um, sort of have that, um, then we could start moving forward with the skills. But again, everyone's different. So I mean, I love DBT, but maybe the patient that I think definitely needs, you know, DBT, maybe not, I mean, they not respond to it. And so that's okay, too. You still could do something else, you know, that's evidence based and that's behind theory which is a lot what we do as well, you know, mindfulness, you know, yes, DBT incorporates mindfulness, but you could just do mindfulness. You could take it from like a, a cognitive behavioral approach. You could take it from a psychodynamic approach. Um, so there's so many different perspectives. So we're, we're DBT informed. I'm a, I'm a clinician that's very DBT informed too, in that, you know, we could have DBT with substance use patients as well. And I think in some of the formal DBT programs, you know, they might not accept folks um, with substance use. And hopefully that sort of changes, which I think it is. You know, there's separate skills for substance use. Um, but I think more clinicians nowadays are becoming more integrative as well, which is nice. So, you know, it's sort of like cooking. You need this, you need this spice, you need that. And then it comes out like to a delicious dish. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's I love of, that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Oh, thank you. It makes us all hungry now. <laughs> yeah, I'm starving. Yeah. 
so what I'm hearing, to be fair, is that a big part of it is compassion. Yes. And I've definitely heard, like, in services that, like, if you're still using, you cannot mm. participate because I guess your brain isn't ready to take it in or, like, you're not, you're in an altered mind state, so you wouldn't yeah. take it in. Would you say that someone making a change slowly in their recovery is because you guys are able to, like, be compassionate with them? Is that, like... Yeah, so I think the field is changing. The field is more open. So, for example, um, DBT is it has a lot of compassion, but also harm reduction is very compassionate and gentle and kind. And just for those folks who don't know harm reduction, harm reduction is not abstinence. Abstinence is part of re harm reduction, but harm reduction is, for example, trying to reduce the harm if you're still using. So not fully taking it away, but you know, if you're using, let's say, cocaine, opiates, and pot, well, maybe let's focus on your opiate use because that's the one that's more, you know, sort of deadly because of overdose and all that stuff. Let's focus on the more lethal stuff and, you know, do it little by little. And so I think in the older days or the old school way of thinking was if you're drinking, if you're using, um, you need to go to detox, you need to go to rehab, like you can't really right. go into like mental health treatment or substance use treatment. It's changing. There's a lot of medication assisted treatment, which is also great. So we don't necessarily have to tell the patient to be hospitalized. Um, there are certain circumstances that they do, you know, depending on medical need, but we should not deny them an assessment. We should not deny them, you know, time to see us and see what we could do. And if they refuse it, you know, let's say, you know, we tell someone, well, you definitely need to, you know, to be hospitalized and they refuse it. I think it's not, you know, beneficial to sort of discharge the person, but sort of compromise on what the patient wants to do, what the individual wants to do. Do they want medication assisted treatment? Do they want Suboxone or even other, you know, medications too, you know, in order to decrease their anxiety and their depression. So it's not necessarily medication assisted treatment for the use, but also for their mental health. Like, why don't we try that first? And if they're open to that, great. If they're open to sort of reduce Reducing their use and let's do that so if they're drinking every day what if they come in you know trying to say well I'm just going to drink on the weekends I'm just going to drink you know after work that's better than nothing and if they're in there in treatment in front of you wanting why say no and so I think the system and what I say the system is sort of like the state and the government I think they're finally sort of opening their eyes that this is sort of the approach that we need to go you know the more humane yeah. approach because there's a lot of people dying with injection sites and everything like if you're going to use then let, let's put folks in an injection site where at least they're monitored so I mean there's different ways to do it and you know there'll definitely be clinicians are like no I'm not gonna do that like send them somewhere else but I think the world is opening that more clinicians are opening their mind that this is like another approach to go about it. Mm. My big thing is is increasing awareness of this. There are some countries where they actually do have that. I think Switzerland might be one of them. They like have centers where like they are able to monitor exactly what they're doing. And like yeah. it just makes you think the rest of the world is a bit backwards, isn't it? Like, yeah, they've been yeah. doing it for years. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I mean, well, harm reduction was, you know, created in Europe as well. Um, and it's been around for decades. And I think finally it's starting, you know, that people are accepting it basically because people are dying. Yeah. So do you want, you know, people to die versus trying these other ways that may be controversial? Um, and then right. you're giving folks a chance um, to live. Yeah. I mean, my experience seems to be like a lot of people with BPD have this all or nothing thinking, right? And so mm -hmm. I think being able mm -hmm. to see things in shades of gray where like, oh, it doesn't have to be I'm using or I'm not. It can be I'm moving towards being healthier. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the, those extreme shifts are hard. And as you said, for people, especially people who are using a lot, drinking a lot, like you can't just stop. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's taking it step by step, you know, think about simple things, for example, of, you know, what do you have to do tomorrow? You know, you might have a lot of things to do. You're not doing all of that at the same time, even though sort of maybe society says that we could do everything all at once. We can't, you know, we only have two hands. We only have one mind. We come on, you know, wash the dishes, do the laundry, take care of our family, whatever it is, you know, do one thing at a time. And that's the same thing with treatment. Um, you can't expect people to come into treatment and tell them, be like, all right, well, you need to stop. Mm. Really? <laughs> that's what that's they're like, in how? treatment for. <laughs> exactly. That's what, that's what folks are in treatment for, for us to help them and for us, 
you know, not only to provide skills, but to give them the hope, to give them the validation that maybe some folks didn't get to believe in themselves. Mm. You know, self-efficacy is a big thing in treatment, not necessarily just in substance use, but it is really big in substance use. Self-efficacy meaning like the belief in yourself that you could do this. If you don't have the belief to do something, then it's not going to happen. So we touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to go into a little more detail. What are some of your observations of stigma about substance use and BPD? And how has the stigma evolved over time? Mental health is less stigmatized today. Again, you know, with um, the younger population, I think with social media, just media overall, movies or TVs or documentaries of what's going on. So that's helping sort of like to educate other people, which I think is wonderful. But there is a lot of stigma still within substance use. A lot of folks don't want to get into substance use work uh, because maybe of the lack of education or the knowledge, or maybe just because folks feel a little bit uncomfortable. This is why like I'm such an advocate to um, train and educate you know, not only, you know, trainees getting into this field, but also, you know, current faculty and staff, um, because they don't necessarily have to um, treat, you know, folks in this niche, but they will be someone in their lives that will have substance use, that will have a personality disorder. And so wouldn't it be nice if we know how to sort of treat them or refer them or interact, you know, with folks as well. So it's not rocket science either. You know, it's just very simple things. I mean, compassion, you know, for me to say like, hey, we need compassion, we need validation. It's not something, you know, so crazy (laughs) that we can't do. But I think it's, you know, just we need to focus on it a little bit more. Um, So with substance use, you know, there is a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of embarrassment as well. I mean, also with borderline personality disorder too. So how can we sort of work with that? How can, you know, we decrease that for them? And also, how can I not add to that? I think the population today is a little bit more open about talking about substance use. And that's why we're seeing, you know, more younger people come in, which is great, I think. You know, it is scary, you know, when someone, when you have an individual there in front of you using really severely, it's not, you know, I have emotions too, Um, And it's okay to sort of talk about those emotions, talk about your experience of like, hey, I'm really concerned about you. I'm really nervous of, you know, what might happen. You know, let's try and figure out how can we reduce the harm? You know, do you have a Narcan kit next to you when you're using? Are you by yourself when you're using? Well, maybe you shouldn't be by yourself. You know, is there a way to check if there's like fentanyl, you know, in your opiates? And there is, you know, so like there's a lot of new things coming around that you still continue to use but still decrease the harm and hopefully at some point, you know, build your insight, build your awareness of like, hey, maybe I should maybe decrease or maybe, you know, stop at some point as well. Um, So there's a lot, there's a lot that we could do, I think. Yeah. Oh man, one of the things you said, it's not rocket science. I, I (laughs) it's so great because maybe it's the all or nothing thinking, but I really struggled with like, Okay, if this is hard to change, it must require a really complicated solution. Like there was something about if the solution is simple, then why is it so hard to apply? This erroneous correlation between like simple must mean easy, but that's not how it works, right? So just because these things are not complicated doesn't make them easy to do. And for some reason, like that was such a revolutionary thing to me. Yeah, it's just the practice. We weren't exposed to it. An example that I always give patients is um, I actually have a green pen in front of me. So what if you know, all my life, I you know, green is green. But one day I said, you know what, you guys, this is red right now. Green is the new red. Um, and that's what I'm asking you to do with your emotions and with all your experiences. Mm. Like, all right, you know, you can't do that. You're going to do this now. It takes a long time. Like all for all my life, I've known this as green. How are you telling me it's red right now? So it's the same thing with all our skills. We definitely can control what we could do. We just have to be open, I guess, to do it. And also we can't do it alone. Hmm. You know, even if it's not reaching out for professional treatment, but just reaching out to peers, to friends, to family support, forums like this in itself is, is truly, you know, therapeutic as well. So it's not necessarily that you have to go see a licensed psychologist. This might be good enough, you know, and saving a life. So one of the things you said was the myth that people cause their issue. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. So let's say someone 
when they were they were younger did experience some trauma you know some abuse in some way it wasn't because of them like they didn't cause the abuse you know it's because of whatever you know whatever the situation was but then so some folks think well i'm the one that's bad i'm the one that's a monster i'm the one that like caused all this like i can't change it's all my fault but it's not you know it's just because of the things that happen around them is has shaped them from who they are um but if we better understand what has happened we can change the individual can change and obviously it takes time because all their lives they've been thinking about this and that's what sort of treatment is for i'm curious about this because you know i i struggled with this a lot and i have I have a friend who was going through something and we would be on the phone and she would say like, I, I can't control myself. I feel like something else is controlling me. It was as if she thought it was as simple as like, I'm just going to make a choice and then I'll be able to stick to it. Right. And my body will just follow what my mind made. And um, so I was just wondering if you could maybe describe what that actually looks like when you are taking control. That's not as sim it's not as simple as just like, oh, I'm different. Right. Like <laughs> it takes a really long, long time. I mean, just for an example, like DBT, right? Like the formal DBT is like six months. Right. Some people re repeat those six months to a year. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're an expert after this as a year. But it's all practice. It's the same thing as riding a bike. If I've if I if I rode a bike when I was ten, and then later on twenty years, I don't know how to ride one. Well, because I didn't have practice, I'm gonna fall. Um, so it's the same thing. And so that and I, again, I bring that up: the self confidence, the self efficacy, because it is huge. If you don't believe in yourself, then you're not going to um, decrease whatever target behavior that you want to decrease. So if somebody is watching this episode and they're like, oh, I have no belief in myself. Like, how do I do this? What would your <laughs> advice be for like first steps for building self, you know, self-belief? It's just trying, you know, just trying to do one thing at one time, you know, and just focus on that. So for example, if someone comes in and says like, hey, I really, you know, want to have a better relationship with my family. I want to um, decrease my use. I want to go back to school, whatever it is. I like just pick one and just focus on that and open yourself to treatment, you know, whatever that treatment may look like. Again, it doesn't necessarily need to, you know, be professional treatment, uh, but sort of be open that there might be other ways to go about having a better life. From a DPT perspective, like building mastery in the things that you do well. Mm hmm even the smallest little things. When you say pick one, right? Mm. What's the duration of time that you need to do that one thing? Oh, I, I think that's a love really the good answer. question. That I would <laughs> love the answer to that. I can't give you a time duration. I would love to say like, hey, it's going to be like within one or two weeks. I can't say that. It really depends on what's going on with the individual. Some folks may not want to work on their substance use, you know, and that's okay too, you know. Let's say they say, like, I want to, you know, have a better job or I want to have a better relationship, you know, with my spouse or something. At some point, they will realize that they need to figure out their substance use first. Right. But at least they're trying to do something, do something. Um, and then hopefully, you know, sort of like the dominoes will go from one to the other and sort of fall in place. Yeah. Because mm. I was asking that, like, more in relation to, I guess like habit building because whatever you are doing is habit building essentially yeah, 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 so yeah. you know like people say oh 28 days some people 66 or whatever like so it literally depends on the individual is what i'm understanding yeah it totally depends and the motivation too you know uh maybe you're not so motivated so for example like some folks come into our program and say like my husband my mother or whatever you you know wants me to come into treatment i'm just not ready to stop yet we're not going to, I'm not going to be punitive about that. I'm like, okay, great. You know, we're here when you're ready and come back. People do come back. We don't want to be harsh and be like, well, you need to stop or you're going to die. And, you know, be so blunt and so punitive. How is that person going to come back knowing that you're going to be punitive? And so if we open the doors and say like, hey, that's okay. You know, if you're not ready to come in, I, I would love to help you get more motivated but you also have the right to say, no, I'm not ready at this time. And if you're not ready, that's okay. What can we do to bring awareness to individuals who need treatment, but are afraid to reach out? 
I'm taking that as sort of a call to action on our end as clinicians, as, you know, providers that I think on our end, we need to do more. We need to educate. We need to train more. We need to um, bring awareness that it's okay to be uncomfortable, but sort of um, embrace that feeling of uncomfortableness so that we as clinicians, as providers could sort of appropriately assess individuals who come in with substance use or borderline personality disorder. Um, that will help us to sort of ease our anxiety or any negative feelings that we might have. Uh, because if we feel skillful, that will increase our self-confidence, right? As well in the belief in ourselves that we could do this. I know there's a lot of good work being done at ERs, um, emergency rooms, in that just because someone comes in with opiate use or alcohol withdrawal, that they don't say no or just say like, hey, you just like need to sleep it off for a while. There are certain things that they could do at that moment um, to sort of prevent another ER visit or even a hospitalization. So there's a huge effort on that end, which is beautiful, but I think we sort of need to continue to sort of bring awareness so that we know what's going on. Did you have any sort of last burning thoughts or, or anything that you wanted to leave our audience with today? I think if there's like any instinct, you know, this inclination of like, hmm, maybe I should, you know, ask for treatment or that I need help, do it, you know, and it, again, it's not necessarily in a professional sense, which is great. Obviously, I'm going to advocate for that. But reaching out to anyone, a loved one, a friend, you know, a teacher, a mentor, someone that you trust could definitely be worthwhile. We shouldn't struggle alone, basically, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for joining us today. I, I'm coming away from this conversation feeling very, very hopeful. Thank you everyone for watching. If you like what you see, make sure that you like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you do not miss a single episode. Next week, we will be back for another brunch and we're gonna be talking about BPD and intergenerational trauma. So make sure you come back for that and we will see you next time. Thank you again, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.